Today on the Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast, Julian Bowen gives us the lowdown on early and higher level communication skills. Over to you, Hina and Marla. Thanks, Andrew. I'm Marla Folden, speech language therapist here at the DSRF and one of the co-hosts of the Lowdown podcast. There are a few common times for a family to start coming to see me here at the DSRF, and usually they're in response to an upcoming transition, such as starting daycare or preschool, going to kindergarten, or even changing schools. In early childhood, by far the most common concern is around how the child is or is not communicating their wants and needs, and the impact that that is having on the child's behavior. Communication it can be a really stressful area for parents, and a reason that many parents pursue therapy for their child. So today we will be chatting with speech language pathologist Jillian Baldwin, um, who will give us the lowdown on early communication in kids with Down syndrome. Jillian has been a part of the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation's team since 2014. She completed her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology at the University of Saskatchewan prior to her master's degree in speech language pathology at the University of British Columbia. At the DSRF in Burnaby, Jillian delivered individual speech, language, social communication, and feeding therapy to children, teens, and young adults. She also taught the social communication portion of a course for young adults, the language express component of summer camp, and provided numerous presentations and workshops for families and educators. Jillian is very excited to now bring the energetic and quality service of DSRF to families around the Okanagan. Hi, Jill. How are you? Hi, I'm pretty good. How are you guys? Good. We're doing really well. Thanks That's for joining good. us. Here Thank you so today. much for inviting me. I'm excited. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, before we get into our real and serious questions, we usually have some secret questions to ask our guests first. Oh. Is that all right with you? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, fantastic. Question number one. What kind of book are you reading right now? I am reading a historical fiction called Resistance Women. Fic- uh, oh, it's fiction. Yes, oh, yeah. It's based on real people, said in real events, but um, obviously the details of the conversations and things going on are fictional, so it's pretty cool. That is very cool. Yeah. I know it's spring right now over in the Okanagan. So what's your favorite springtime activity to do with the family? With the fam? Um, We, I know it was a little chilly here last week, but thinking about last spring, we started to really enjoy just going down to the lake near our house and throwing down a picnic blanket and just letting our little girl play. And this year I'm sure she'll be running around and digging and getting into mischief. So I'm excited Mm -hmm. to do that. Are there ducks to feed? There are so many ducks (laughs) to chase, to quack at, to feed. (laughs) (laughs) What, in your opinion, is the best kind of cupcake? Cupcake? Um, I just love chocolate, everything chocolate. So (laughs) we'll go with chocolate, cupcake with chocolate icing. You can give it a twist by making it mint chocolate icing. Ooh, ooh, great. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> um, this is a stressful time for everybody. For our yeah. listeners, we're recording this during the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you have a de-stressing routine that you like to use right now? Not as good of a routine as I should probably develop for myself. Um, But I am making sure that my daughter and I get outside once a day, whether it's just to play in the yard or go for a walk around our neighborhood. Just getting fresh air is good for us, I think. What I should do is my, my auntie has a yoga studio, so she's been posting on YouTube some yoga and meditation videos. So I've tried to do those a little bit in the evening and I should keep that up. Yeah. That's How about you guys? Any it. tips? I have been doing very loud singing while I'm cooking. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> very de-stressing for me. Um, I can just tune out everything and sing my Joni Mitchell and just go with it. Perfect. So you're not restricted to singing Rafi. That's great. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's usually not Rafi at high volume while I'm cooking. What about you, Hina? 
Yeah, no, I was just going to say I'm having one-on-one -on -one dance parties, just putting some music on. There's so many YouTube videos for dance workouts, which I really like. So I love Zumba. Yeah, Zumba, yeah. There's like really fun hip-hop dance videos. You can learn how to do, you know, combinations. But then, then I agree with Jill. Yoga is have yoga and walks have been kind of my saving grace yeah. right now. They've really helped a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. The hard thing is just, of course, still finding the time for yes. this self-care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. am still commuting in the morning, which I think helps me a lot. Because usually oh, yeah. all of my families know that I walk to work. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I just walk in a big loop and I make it take the same amount of time and just end up back at my own house and then Genius. start working from there. Good for you. So That's such a good myself idea. get outside. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. We have one more secret question for you. Oh, yes, the secret question. Yes, because it is asparagus season coming up what would be your favorite way to cook asparagus <laughs> you know what i did cook asparagus last week i did it in the oven for not too long because i usually make it too smushy and um so it was still crunchy and i'm trying to remember i think i mixed up there was like dijon maple syrup pepper garlic olive oil and poured that over and it was really good that sounds oh, really sounds good. like mm. it. Yeah, and I'm coming to yours for days. <laughs> we made it with salmon, and I could put the same sauce on the salmon too. So, highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for answering our secret questions. They weren't too bad. You Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So Jill, you know, Marla and I've had the pleasure of working with you in the past, and now you have a great community outreach position in the interior of British Columbia. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that journey came about and what are some of the things you're doing there right now? Sure. So as you said in my intro, I worked at the DSRF right in Burnaby for a number of years, and I, I mean, the theme to the story is just that I loved it and I felt like I learned so much um, to specialize in Down syndrome and just felt really connected to the families and my coworkers, mm -hmm. and really felt like I wanted to be a lifer there and um, a couple of years ago once I found out I was expecting my first child. Things took a bit of a turn when we and my husband and I ended up deciding to move to Kelowna mm -hmm. um, to be near my whole family and to have a house that we could afford um, mm -hmm. once we were starting this family. And so the hardest part about moving was thinking about leaving the DSRF. That was the heartbreaking part. And so the really exciting twist was when, uh, you know, our bosses talked to me about the idea that it doesn't really have to be cutting of ties and that, you know, part of the DSRF's mandate is to be accessible across the province, of course. And so we kind of worked off the idea of me getting, you know, really trained and indoctrinated in <laughs> Burnaby, and then now coming out to Kelowna and applying that knowledge and I guess you could say the passion and skills out here. Um, so of course, I took my my year of mat leave to just focus on <laughs> surviving, maybe thriving in motherhood. Um, but then once that came to an end, uh, then I really started to inch out of my house and provide some form of service out in the Okanagan region um, for families and educators of people with Down syndrome. And so it really just started as providing regular workshops in the evening for people to attend. And slowly now I've also been able to carve out time to also offer consultations. So offering to either go into schools or homes. It could be one off or a bit more, you know, every month or so or with check ins. Um, so that'll be nice too to get to know people a bit more one to one in that way too. Um, and so yeah, of course, you did say we're in the middle of this health crisis mm -hmm. around the world. So I'm stepping back into my house to be more available at my computer for people um, hopefully creating more resources or doing some video consults. But 
once this lifts and we can hopefully return to normalcy, I'll resume my workshops and try to keep reaching out in for the form of one-to-one -one consultations. But really kind of the cool thing is being flexible to morph to what the need is, you know, and so if people need me to do more, so like a regular group for new parents or maybe even some training for workplaces as far as interviews and hiring people with Down syndrome, you know, I can kind of flex to whatever the demand is for now, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so hopefully we can get back to that soon. And it's great because before this health crisis, um, started, you did have the opportunity to present a couple of times and there were very, yeah. very well attended presentations. Yeah. So the need is definitely there. Yeah, that was really encouraging. Just the turnout and enthusiasm. Everyone was just eating up, you know, whatever was being offered. So that made me feel really good that there is the need and the want. So I'm mm -hmm. happy to try my best to meet that and in the spare time that I can carve out right now. Yeah. And did you always intend to specialize in working with people with Down syndrome? Like, How did that come about? Yeah. So when I, a big reason that I even applied um, to the master's program of speech and language pathology was knowing that you can work with individuals with developmental disabilities. I think that was in my cover letter in my application for the program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that was really a big reason for applying and um, so I did have that in mind as somewhere I'd like to end up specializing in once I was working and so I do remember in school when um, we had our lectures specifically on Down syndrome um, Susan Fawcett, who is still at the DSRF, as she was a head SLP, she came to teach our class of learning SLPs about people with Down syndrome. And just hearing from her, hearing about the population and some details about the DSRF in particular, just were really intriguing to me. Um, but it kind of stopped there for a few years until I finished school did some work in Calgary in the schools while my now husband was still finishing up his schooling. But as soon as we were able to work our way back to Vancouver, before I even set foot on Vancouver <laughs> soil, I had uh, had the pleasure of talking to Susan and interviewing and pretty much arranging um, some work at the DSRF um, for as soon as I arrived mm -hmm. and was available. So um, yeah, I found my way there in not too many years after graduating and have been there ever since. So yeah. yeah that's amazing. You are a lifer just like Marla and I. <laughs> Yeah, yep. that's, that's very back. clear now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel very fortunate that I was able to work my way in there, and that yeah. they've been so good about keeping me involved even when I left Vancouver. So that's been unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're well, lucky. I mean, to it's really a win-win for you, you and everybody out there in the Okanagan. It's a good thing to have you there. So that's really nice. Really that well. is the feedback I'm getting. People are really looking for that specialty and services and even not just mm -hmm. families but teachers yays even other slps you know working in schools or other practices people are very receptive to getting our expertise mm -hmm. so it's the great. lowdown if you will <laughs> the lowdown that's what yeah. i put on my business card <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like we were talking about communication is really a big focus for families with young kids and even though you and I Jill don't only work with young kids we work with you know everybody a big portion of our caseload at any given time usually is younger children Definitely. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what parents can expect as their kid mm -hmm. begins to learn those some communication skills right so expectations that's yeah pretty much one of the first questions you get when you first meet a family right um so i see why you're bringing that up and um it can be aggravating because my first answer usually has to be there's so much variety so you can't exactly yes, give throw them out a, the window. a perfect <laughs> prediction and so yeah that's you know our what number one disclaimer today and when we give presentations or talking to families, 
we're working one-to-one with is just emphasizing that variation. And Mm -hmm. so between individuals with Down syndrome, so I mean, you can look at one child or adult with Down syndrome and you can't assume or expect that yours will develop in the same way. Just like any other human being, we see so much variability because everyone's unique, of course. Uh, But of course, when people ask what to expect, you're kind of hinting at milestones, you know, and any parent likes to look at those numbers. So seeing what skills we should expect to see at what age. So what we can really say is that typically we see that development is slower compared to other typically developing children. There will be delays. And we also interestingly can see a relative delay. So within the same child with Down syndrome, we can often see delay on average with their communication skills, even compared to their own cognitive or motor development as well. But of course, this can change over time. And especially when you have early intervention, we would particularly hope to see this change in profile over time. But um, going back to milestones, we shy away from that because, of course, it's hard to gather and study these milestones in kids with Down syndrome. So we often end up seeing numbers and ages that apply to uh, the general population. Um, And that's not really the most useful thing to see um, when we think about expecting a bit of a delay. And so, yeah. So really though, milestones don't have to be completely uh, ignored or useless because of course we still have them, I'm sure taped up somewhere on the office wall to refer to, Um, and the way that they are helpful is number one, you can see what is that expected order of skills and how we would hope to see things progress. So it can be a guide of what our next goal should be. So kind of a reasonable next step to work on. And number two, milestones can still be useful because they help us just realize what our children have already achieved, you know, so we might be looking at that really far away milestone, um, many steps away of talking, maybe talking in a full sentence or telling a full story. But if we have a good list of milestones or steps, it can really highlight all those smaller steps along the way that are really important and that should be celebrated too and I think for parents and even for therapists it's something that's really important to keep noticing you know to encourage ourselves and our kids that they really are making progress and we have to notice those baby steps along the way yeah Mm -hmm. I think often what families are looking for is almost the cherry on top of the cupcake yeah, You know, of like, I really want my kid to have an independent two-way conversation where they ask and answer questions. Like that right. is a very, very long-term goal. And we really need the whole cupcake base if we're going to continue <laughs> with that metaphor <laughs> and the frosting before we can just stick the cherry right on top of that. And that's where those milestones are helpful because we know we're aiming towards that, but let's look at what comes before that so we can develop those communication skills. Definitely. And besides making me very hungry now, um, (laughs) I like that you point that out because you're really emphasizing that you need that base and you need to do things in that general order um, before you jump right to slathering on some icing or throwing a cherry in there. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for some of those fundamental communication skills, you know, things around joint attention and shared enjoyment and some of those kind of things were really not even we could teach somebody to verbatim maybe word for word copy a sentence but that doesn't mean they understand the purpose of you know chatting conversation if they don't understand joint attention and shared enjoyment some of those fundamentals first so we really really do need them right and you're right that if you jump too quickly or too far to these later steps um it is actually ill-advised because you haven't built those earlier necessary skills as your foundation. And so 
yeah, I guess going back to your question of what parents can expect, you've pointed out too that they can look for and expect to be focusing more early on, not just on words or sentences, Mm -hmm. or maybe not even speech sounds, but um, they can expect to be practicing and looking at some of those base interaction skills earlier on. So like you said, working just on joint attention or taking turns and copying each other, paying attention to each other is huge before you can, so that they can learn to even just be paying attention to you to copy the way that you make sounds or when you use words, what you're actually referring to. Yeah. Yeah. And I would really encourage any family who's listening, if this has happened to you or is happening to you where your speech therapist or somebody else is doing something that you don't really understand what the point of that is. So you, you've gone in and you said, I want to work on you know, talking and then there is your speech therapist working on goofy games or like (laughs) getting eye contact or something else, definitely ask them why they're doing that and what's the purpose of that and how that works towards your long-term goals. Because by far the majority of the time, the speech therapist is usually super happy to explain it to you Mm -hmm. and walk you through how that process is going to look over time. And it's definitely easier to work on things at home home when you understand what long-term goals you're working towards. Definitely. So, yeah, check in with your people. Yeah, that's really good right. advice. And I mean, yes, as speech pathologists, we're that is part in our heads of explain, you know, while you're doing the therapy mm-hmm. um, and focusing on the child, trying to explain what you're doing and why to the parents. But just naturally, I think it becomes so natural to us that, mm-hmm. of course, this is what we do and why, that you, we sometimes might need a check-in, a reminder that it's not so obvious. Um, yes. And I love, yeah, when parents ask, much better than them sitting there, like you said, either being confused or almost disappointed, feeling like it looks like we're just playing or that we're not actually working on speech. Mm-hmm. So it's good to clarify and understand why especially like you said so that they can do it at home because it it can't just be assumed that from our perspective that by watching what we're doing they know exactly why we're doing it and how they should do it at home so asking even if it feels like it might sound a little silly yeah those are sometimes the best conversations or things that can happen in a session Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think you and I are the same and Hina I know for sure um, we all love a good question. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I would happily tell you about it all day and night. So mm-hmm. by all means, ask me. We're going to take a little break here. And then when we come back, let's talk about what parents can do at home to help their child start talking. Sure. Show the world you love someone with Down syndrome. DSRF Down Syndrome's wake shop is stocked with shirts, baby clothes, bags, and more. Whether you're looking for World Down Syndrome Day products, DSRF brand merchandise, or general Down Syndrome items, we have what you're looking for. Love Live on 21st chromosome and Down Syndrome Drake lives at dsrf.org slash shop. My name is Andrew. I am the photographer. Photos are my interest because I love scenes. It makes me feel very close to people. My photo cards are on my Etsy shop through Andrew's eyes at dsrf.org slash Andrew. Don't forget to watch my video through Andrew's eyes on YouTube. So before the break, we just started talking about what parents can do to help their child start talking at home. I know a lot of parents feel a lot of pressure, like they have to make their kid start talking. And I would really like to take the pressure off. So maybe we could talk a little bit about how kids can learn language by being talked to and being shown things like around in their environment. Yes, for sure. So um, mixed message I'll, I'll provide. <laughs> First thing is that, like you said, having just a lot of language modeled for them throughout the day is the best way, right? Because you need to 
hear words that are that apply to things that they're seeing or witnessing or feeling and doing but what makes it a mixed message is on the flip side, we also um, have to step things back a bit to avoid overloading them. Um, so just, you know, spewing sentences and songs and words and labels constantly all day so that we can kind of slow things down and give some space for processing or maybe even for the child to try some to say some things themselves. And when you leave a bit of space, that means you can more easily emphasize the important parts. So when you are labeling something, labeling a toy they're using or an action you're doing, um, when you can leave room around that word that applies to what you're doing, um, it really draws attention to that and mm -hmm. like I said, it gives them room to try as well and just to process because we know our kids with down syndrome need more time to process what they've heard and seen mm -hmm. and so we need to give space for that so when you say leave space around a word mm -hmm. you know what I automatically think of is sort of two things yep. um, one of them is speaking more slowly Definitely. so that your words are kind of easier to hear. Mm -hmm. If you think that most of our students with Down syndrome have some kind of hearing complication, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that what we are providing to them is as clear as possible. Mm -hmm. And that means slowing down your speech a little bit. And then the other piece of that is what I sort of conceptualize in my own brain as sort of key wording where it's almost like, what would I type this into Google as, or something like that? You know, <laughs> yeah. If we're playing with a ball, I'm just going to type ball or maybe blue ball into Google. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to go super wild on all of the aspects of the game that I'm playing with the ball. Mm -hmm. Those aren't as important as just ball. Yeah. That makes any sense. That's probably my own brain's strange way of conceptualizing it but definitely definitely so yeah like you said slowing it down but also simplifying what mm -hmm. you're saying and you can still keep it natural um mm -hmm. but you're just using fewer words and keeping it a bit more concrete because more abstract is also um more challenging to manage especially when they're younger and also there's something to be said for those simple concepts you you exp you described modeling um repeating it as well mm -hmm. so saying it a lot maybe in different situations or in different ways but just by repeating it it goes along with the idea of slowing it down, that you hear it again to help remember and learn what it's referring to. Um, I would also add a third thing that I mean by leaving space, and that's actually like pausing. So leaving yeah. some quiet times. I think that for any parent, when we're trying to help our children learn to talk, we feel like the right thing to do is to just keep modeling modeling saying all the words <laughs> um, but there's a lot of value too in pausing so it's actually good to be quiet sometimes and give them room whether it's to process or to try themselves like I said and would you Jill um, or Marla would you guys recommend a particular amount of time to you know like is it do we I've seen a lot of the times people will wait just like two or three seconds but like mm -hmm. just to give people an idea out there of how much time it might take to process like is there a particular amount of time that we should wait to let them process like is it a five second ten second thirty second it can be different for different individuals you know we've had yeah. some students that need a very long time um, but you could start to challenge yourself to just count to ten in your head mm -hmm. Or maybe yeah. even start with five. That might feel, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that might feel really long. Mm -hmm. Let's say yeah. today start with trying to just count to five and then work your way up to 10. And that could be a good mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I like to sort of test it out and take mm -hmm. sort of a, a curious approach to it where I will count five to myself in my head and see if that looks like enough time. And the mm -hmm. reason, the way I'll know whether it's enough time is if the child looks at me or does something differently or tries mm. to copy me, make some kind of attempt, then I'm like, okay, five is pretty good. But if I don't get anything in that pause, then I'm going to try longer. Mm -hmm. And I'll go up to about 30 seconds 
before mm-hmm. I d- decide, okay, this is actually too high of a level overall and we're going to bring the whole thing down. Mm-hmm. And it's worth trying different pause times at different times of the day. So when your child's more alert and awake and able to focus, you probably won't need to pause as long where if they're tired or having a hard time or it's a difficult activity, they are going to need more time to process the information and then make their own attempt to respond to you. So I wish there was a secret number that you could (laughs) apply across kids and across situations and there isn't, but taking a curious approach is is a solid way to kind of figure out where your kid's at on any given day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the first step, I mean, it it is nice to have those numbers to aim for, but the first step is just to kind of be more aware of it. So Mm -hmm. even if it's just now on your mind for the rest of the day after listening to this, that's the biggest step Mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back, you know, I said we so far we're talking about for parents of young children to model. And so we've talked about modeling these focused words. And again, that can be an SLP assuming people know what we mean by that. <laughs> and so when we yeah. say model, um, Marla already gave a good example of maybe starting with just one word when you're talking about something and so what do we mean by these words you know it can definitely I think naturally we label a lot so that's using nouns like the names for things so labeling ball bubbles what do kids eat all the time cheese (laughs) Um, but um, so that's great but then we could also aim to go beyond nouns or those labels and label action words so verbs So if you're outside, you can be talking about run and jump or drive and sit. Stop, go, some of those really fun ones. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. like there's so much when you're playing um, that involve action words. Even if you're just playing with a ball, now you can think about talking about kick, bounce, roll, stop, throw, you know. And then there's describing words. So those are adjectives. So talking about the colors, the shapes maybe the texture of things, if it's squishy or smooth or hot or cold. And And the way that you choose which words you're going to go for usually depends on what part of your activity the child's most interested in. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing ball and your little guy or girl is really interested in the goofy texture on the ball, then you're going to talk about that. But if they're really interested in throwing it, then you talk about that. And you're kind of trying to match or pair words with what they are doing with the item. And that's why that pause time is good too, because it gives you a chance to stop and try to tune into what they're paying attention to and interested in. Um, And then that's what you would want to be commenting on. And keyword is comment. So we're not always quizzing and asking questions. What's that? What color is that? Mm. What's it doing? Mm. But you can more so think of yourself as a sports commentator who's just describing what they're doing and seeing, which is fun. Let's talk and about, let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Why, why do we not like quizzing as SLPs? <laughs> it's a really easy pitfall to get into because as parents, you know, you're really anxious to see, does my child know this or not? You know, I want to make sure that they know it. Have I taught them enough? Like, are we good now? Do we get this? <laughs> and it's it's an inclination that we really want to try and avoid. As, as mm-hmm. SLPs. can you talk a little bit about that? I think just at its root, quizzing, even the word quiz. <laughs> we yeah. all have our associations. With, <laughs> um, asking questions, it more so can put the child on the spot. So feeling like they're being tested and that it has some inherent inherent pressure to it um, versus when we're just commenting or modeling what they could say, um, you're removing that pressure from them. Mm-hmm. And I especially considering, you know, for my daughter, she is in a phase right now where she gets really excited when she knows things. So when we flip through books, she kind of likes when I say, oh, where's the owl? What does the cat say? She's pumped to give me that answer. But if she didn't know any of it, that would, you know, lead to her, you know, feeling 
I'm, you know, disappointed in it or maybe even shutting down in that interaction. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that our kids with Down syndrome will have more challenges with language and with talking, especially earlier on. Um, so we don't want to build any sort of stress or friction around it. We want communication to stay fun and motivating and just naturally rewarding as a social thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring it back to what you said a little bit ago too, where one of the key profile pieces for communication for people with Down syndrome is that their communication abilities are lower than their cognitive abilities. So mm -hmm. when you're quizzing them, very likely your student does know, but they mm -hmm. cannot tell you. And that in itself is super frustrating. So frustrating. I mean, imagine having that, being able to picture that answer, having that answer in your mind, but not being able to make your mouth move the way you want it to, mm -hmm. or not being able to get the words in the order that you want them to be in. And, you know, what we usually, what this usually looks like then is the student getting frustrated. They want to end the game. They don't want to play anymore. And then communication gets this kind of bad rap for them where they're like, right. oh, I don't even want to go there. Yeah, and That's you've just shut down the pleasure of that whole activity where yeah. when you going back to when you're describing that building of the cupcake, um, you're trying to jump ahead to the cherry on top by getting them to say it. But by shutting down the whole activity, you've lost your opportunity for working on some of those base skills, you know, so mm -hmm. working on having your pleasurable interaction. Maybe they're taking turns. Maybe they're listening and paying attention to what you're describing. Um, not to mention the most key part of just the pleasure of sharing that activity together. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to lose all of that by mm -hmm. turning it into work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Turning it into a high pressure thing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about a way that we can sort of enhance the modeling that we're doing that is really popular for families who have a kid with Down syndrome and families overall. And that mm -hmm. is using sign language. Mm -hmm. And it's popular for a very good reason. So students with Down syndrome often have the ability to control their hands mm -hmm. quite accurately before they develop the ability to speak and move their mouth with the same level of accuracy or at least the level of accuracy required for speaking. So there's many reasons that it's popular. Um, what are your thoughts on sign language in early childhood? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be a huge proponents for this. Yes, you already started to touch on why it's so great. Um, mm -hmm. And like you've said, you're adding that gestural component that's more of a relative strength for people with Down syndrome especially. Um, you're adding a visual component so um, mm -hmm. they can see what you're signing. And it's that tactile input too of them actually trying to sign with their hands. Because we know that the auditory channel or what they're hearing is particularly more challenging compared to what they can um, see. So that's a huge reason to do it. And then, you know, of course, we have research on our side too um, that's finding that it does support language development. As you said, during, especially during this phase when children are still learning language, but it might be that it's beyond the capabilities of their speech. So what they're actually saying with their mouths yet. So you're kind of giving them a little bridge in the meantime um, to get through that. And that's why sign language or other kinds of visuals or augmentative systems of communication can be referred to as um, transitional communication methods um, because we're thinking that it's boosting them along in the meantime while they need it. Mm -hmm. And then in that way, we're continuing to challenge and move along their language without kind of dragging it down because of where their speech skills are at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will, I'll paint a little bit of a picture here. And this is something that happens in my office fairly regularly when a child is learning how to speak. You know, let's say they have the B sound and the uh sound, and those are some of the earliest ones. So they can say, buh. 
and maybe that's all they can say for a little while. So they say mm-hmm. ba, but you as the parent don't know if they mean ball or blue or bubbles or buckle mm-hmm. or maybe even a totally different word like food, but they, all they can say is ba. But if they're signing, they're able to help you understand much more effectively what they mean. So they're going to try and maybe say a, a little bit of a word, however far they are with that, but follow that with some sign. And the frustration level for the whole family comes right down mm-hmm. because we're able to communicate more clearly. And so when Jill says transitional communication tool, it's like, it's kind of a bridge, you know, it's kind of helping you out from getting where your child is now adding the supports and everything needed so that you can get sort of over this big thing onto the other side where they're going to be speaking more in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really it's helping to get your message in if they can see the sign as well. And then it's helping to get their message out when they have one. And that's the key word, just frustration, (laughs) Um, getting over that frustration. And you're then still teaching the value of trying to communicate you know because if it is more successful by using sign language then the child is seeing the purpose of trying to communicate right you're getting people to understand what you're wanting or needing or interested in or trying to say so you're really reinforcing it and then that means they will they're more likely to keep trying and keep practicing and learning words and expressing words And going back to, like you said, um, if they are at the level of, you know, one word at a time with their speech, maybe you can, with their sign language, be working on putting two words together. Can be So that's how it's also helping with um, not just the clarity of their message, but I guess how the complexity of it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Giving space for their language skills. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more about frustration because that that's a really huge thing yeah and lots of parents will come in and say like my kid is so frustrated you know and it's my fault because I don't understand him and what do I do Mm -hmm. and one of the things you can do is sign but that's not the only thing you can do yes Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that yeah so I mean giving them for frustration the number one thing is just giving them their easiest way to communicate for the time to communicate for the time being so um if you that like you said can look like using sign language but it can also be adding other visual forms like pictures picture symbols gestures or even more higher technology options so for people listening you might have or have seen others use a program on an iPad or some other form of technology that has buttons that you press that select a word and build a message and maybe even probably says it aloud. So these are all adding to your speech as a way, as your kind of tools to get the message out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the key word is adding visuals, 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 which we are in love with. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. So um, that's a big topic. Look, yeah. And they don't have to look just one way. No. You know, visuals can be a whole bunch of different things. And, it, mm-hmm. you know, we're not saying that your two-year-old with Down syndrome needs to have an iPad to communicate. That's nope. what we're saying at all. It's just making sure that tool belt is as well stocked as possible. So maybe it doesn't include an iPad, but maybe it doesn't. And that's something to talk about with your SLP and the other people on your child's team too. I would recommend getting an OT in there with you if at all possible, because they have such great insight on sort of the physical side of how are we going to access our communication tools if that's what we're using. Well, and the access is so key in using these tools because one the first thing is having them and then the second thing is using them using Mm -hmm. them effectively and functionally yeah Yeah. and so number one to using them is we can't just have it and assume that the child can then just run with it first step is teaching how to actually use them and why (laughs) and then number two is having them, you said, accessible. So not shoved in a backpack or in a pile 
in a kitchen drawer, that they're, they're out and the child can access them when they need to uh, build a message. And so that's why we love sign language, because it can be with you at all times. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, everyone involved with the child needs to put their heads together um, so that whether they're at home, in the car, at school or daycare, in their occupational therapy session, everybody around them, you know, knows that this tool exists and how to use it. And they, you know, re reinforce the child for using it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to change track a little bit here. Lots of parents in my experience, and I'm sure in yours too, come in very concerned because their child is not talking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times this isn't a major concern. It kind of depends on the child's age and stage and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But at what point should parents be worried if their child isn't talking yet? Right. So again, um, lots of times people look for a hard age <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, there's other things that are really important to me that I would ask about first. First of all is what we just talked about, the frustration. And so I would be especially concerned if the child is getting frustrated and probably even using more problematic behavior to express what they want or that they're frustrated. I think that to me is a big reason to, I guess, worry about their communication or at least act on it. So look for, um, you know, and ideally we get ahead of that. So before we really reach that frustration and problem behavior, um, we can already be working on their communication, but also looking for other um, temporary means like visuals and sign language and stuff. So those are big things for me to worry per se about their communication. Next, of course, just if they're missing out on chances to participate in things. To me, that's, that's a, a huge reason as well to consider that a concern and do something about it. And then another reason to worry, number three, is when you stop seeing progress. So of course, so we talked earlier about progress doesn't just mean they're talking and now they're talking in sentences and now they can answer questions. Progress can mean all those small, important little steps along the way. And it might be slow, those, it might be small progress and sometimes it can be sporadic, right? So you might see big jumps yeah. and then a bit of a plateau or weight, but it's also when we're not seeing that progress or especially losing skills that we saw before that I would worry about communication as well. So those are kind of my big three. I guess I'd also add to it besides talking per se, I'd worry when we don't see those little skills along the way as well. So yeah. um, when we discussed, you know, smiling, wanting to interact with people in whatever form that takes, wanting to, you know, copy or take turns, those are all the skills along the way that I would be concerned if I didn't see those. So these are all right. things that aren't actually about necessarily their talking, but it's all things that are bigger red flags for me. I'll pause to let you add to that, Marla, if you have more. Yeah, no, I, I think you spelled it out really, really beautifully. I think I would just emphasize that not talking looks a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So sometimes not talking looks like the best game of charades ever, <laughs> where <laughs> the student exactly. is doing this amazing job of gesturing. They're making eye contact with you. They're participating in lots of games, not by speaking, but by communicating with their whole body. So they are very, communicating a whole lot. Yeah. And, you know, they're pointing and they're bringing you to what they want and bringing the things that they want you to open to you and all those kind of things. And that's a very different picture than if our child is, again, not talking, but also not engaging with you and wants to be on their own or, you know, sometimes you even have a hard time inserting yourself into whatever right. activity they're playing. And those are very different forms of not talking. And my, you know, my verbal illustration here was kind of two extremes and every, 
most people are in between those two. Mm -hmm. Um, But not talking doesn't just mean one thing is I guess how I would emphasize that. Yeah. I think we nailed Uh, it with the word engaging. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Almost what we care about more. Yeah. Hina. No, sorry. I was just, that's a really good point you guys bring up because I often hear parents, caregivers, teachers kind of use the word communication and talking interchangeably. So right. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, my, my child doesn't communicate at all. He's non-communicative. He's non-verbal. So I think it's really important to also understand what each of those terms means when we're describing a kiddo because they do mean different things. And I think what you guys are highlighting that is that a communication can come from so many different ways. It doesn't right. have to necessarily involve speech. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's exactly right. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing that we used to say in sort of the presentations that we do is, you know, emailing is communicating, but it's not talking. And so is texting. And so is, mm-hmm. you know, looking on the internet at things. Those are all different kinds of communication that mm-hmm. aren't talking. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. So that means, again, it's all of those forms of communication are things that can be worked on um, and also mm-hmm. things that need to be appreciated because there's usually a lot more communication going on than we might appreciate if the child isn't talking yet or talking much Mm -hmm. yeah and I've also noticed that and what is what is your guys advice on this actually because I know a lot of the times um, some of our older kiddos will try to communicate something with us and if their speech isn't very clear a lot of the times our gut instinct is just not along be like Mm -hmm. "Mm -hmm," or pretend to understand can you give a few pointers or some strategies for our listeners when they kind of encounter that kind of a situation where they really want to understand what they're, the person that they love in their life with Down syndrome is trying to say, but they really cannot make heads or tails of it. So what would you recommend we do? Yeah, you're, you're right. As the first step is we don't want to pretend we understood because they will realize if we didn't get oh, yeah. their message correctly. Um, and so then that's even more frustrating or disappointing or just annoying for people to forget. (laughs) Uh, Yes. And so especially as they get older. So that's number one is you can be honest and say you didn't get that, but you can stay calm and relaxed. And now you're entering a bit of a teamwork to um, get there together. So um, if you know this individual well you might already know some of the tricks that help to say things more clearly and you can prompt them to do that so asking them often it could be things like saying it again slower Mm -hmm. or I'll even just say you know move your mouth more because that can just be kind of over emphasizing their articulation a bit more Um, Maybe they need to look at you because it's hard to understand if they were looking down or looking away or covering their face. You might go beyond the way they say it and ask them to act it out or gesture or show you. Or especially as they get a bit older and have more insight, it turns into a bit of uh, a game of saying, can you say it another way or can you give me some Mm -hmm. hints you know and if they give you what it's related to um, you can start to work your way towards it you know narrowing down the topic even you might know what they often talk about so oh is this about your friend Johnny at school or is this about something on the weekend at home you that might often be you know a key and as the kids get older The hope, especially as a therapist, what we often work on is to train them to learn what tricks, what strategies help Mm -hmm. to clarify their message so that eventually they can jump to using those on their own. Um, So then even if they're talking to someone who doesn't know what strategies to prompt them to use, we're hoping the student can start to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. Also encouraging them to use if they have um, some other system like sign language or technology or just picture symbols, um, encouraging them to go to that or writing, Mm -hmm. sometimes writing a word or writing the first letter. It's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a game. And I mean, there will be days when, or moments when you are just totally stuck. You can both try to 
keep it light and laugh about it together. Like, oh man, this is annoying. (laughs) It's okay at some point to decide you need to step away, whether you've run out of time or both either of you, you know, run out of patience, but you can say, let's take a break and let's try again in a few minutes or after recess or something. Um, I just implore you to honor that then and really do go back to it and try again because if that becomes an empty promise um, that would be really discouraging for the child as well if you said yeah let's try later and then that just is your way to kind of get out of it leave it yeah 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 I'm full of I'm full of analogies today. I like uh, it. It's painting <laughs> beautiful pictures. <laughs> What's coming to mind for me as a way to sort of illustrate what it feels like to have somebody just like smile and nod and therefore write you off is mm-hmm. if you were traveling and somewhere where you don't speak the correct language, but you've kind of learned some 10 phrases or whatever. So you go up to somebody and you ask them where the washroom is and they smile at you and they nod and then they walk away you're just Ugh. mad then because yeah. you, you know they didn't get the message and you know they were maybe polite and I think that's where the feeling that you should smile and nod comes from because nobody wants anybody to feel bad so it comes from mm-hmm. this place of like I'll just pretend like it's okay but our students know for sure they know that you just smiled yeah. and nodded because you can't respond in the right way Mm -hmm. If they're asking you a question or something and you just kind of smile and nod, then the communication breaks down anyway. Mm -hmm. So you might as well pursue it with some curiosity and teamwork to try and figure out what they really meant. Mm -hmm. Great advice. All of the analogies today. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) I have one last question for you here. What advice would you give for students who are a little bit older Mm -hmm. and working on some two-way conversations? Oh, yes. Um, Well, first of all, I, with a lot of my older students, we often have a kind of one pager visual of some of those repair strategies, we would call Mm -hmm. them. So um, as I had just mentioned, working on them thinking of their own strategies to repair a breakdown. Um, So that's one tip I have and better yet if you have that visual around while they're still learning you can kind of treat it like a little menu as a reminder Mm -hmm. but as far as just generally supporting conversation itself we are I think all of us who work together are pretty maniacal about (laughs) using conversation starters (laughs) and that can be a bit of a script of how conversations generally begin and unfold so it could start with practicing and of course you we usually add visuals to this script of hi how are you i'm however you feel and then starting with a question um that can start getting the flow going that we all follow And then as far as specific starters for what those questions could be or those topics could be, we also make a lot of visual boards. And that's just a fancy way of saying having a page with different words or pictures displayed to choose from or to remind you of some topics or questions that people commonly can Mm -hmm. use. And so I know for us, it could look like having a page out that has, you know, school, weekend, sports, weather, movies out there. And then you can take turns choosing what you'll talk about. Or it can also be a good way to remind the person what you were talking about. So Mm -hmm. another skill, not only initiating conversation, but maintaining it. And with these visuals or these choices, the key is you can have more or less depending on kind of what that person can handle. Mm -hmm. So you might just put out a couple of choices if they really like to talk about movies or music. But for some, you know, teenagers will have a page of, you know, 12 topics um, because we can we can enjoy covering those in one conversation or throughout our time together. Yeah, so that's a good place to start. And then thinking more about maintaining conversations, 
I like to practice a lot around um, taking turns so that I'm not the person carrying the whole conversation and asking every question and making every comment. But on the flip side, maybe my student is the type that they're the, mostly the only one talking and sharing things. Yeah. So also teaching to give me turns or ask, mm -hmm. ask about me or comment on what I said. So we can practice a lot about taking those yeah. turns and trying to keep it even. And again, back to visuals, yeah. you can bring in a board that has like a my turn, your turn. You can bring in, you know, tangible objects like, I don't know, blocks or coins or whatever is age appropriate and almost like keeping score of the number of turns each person takes. Yeah. What are some Honest things you like to do? Oh, honestly, my favorite one for turn taking is so simple. It's just having your own name and the other person's name and <laughs> then deciding in advance how many questions are we each going to be asking and letting the other, letting the student have control over that. Are we going to have three questions each day or we're gonna have five questions and then just mm. putting little boxes and I usually start with me being the one in charge of noticing when questions have been asked and checking those boxes mm -hmm. and I like to give that control over to the student over time so that they're keeping track how many questions have I asked how many questions has the other person asked and then slowly 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 we fade that away mm -hmm. to where it would just be my name my name and the student's name and they're able to kind of keep that conversational flow going and that takes a long time to fade right. that but it's super clear yes it's so concrete yeah. you're not just saying keep asking or keep talking but yeah you're you're like, Ooh, i've asked three and you've asked none <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly yeah. and you're also not saying like oh a conversation must have 100 turns <laughs> they have no idea yeah. what you're doing by keep it going so what those boxes to begin with are a nice concrete way to show them the manageable goal of your yeah. going as three maybe yeah exactly. that's great exactly. and it's adaptable by student by day so if you know your student's not feeling well then mm -hmm. we do talk in some of our other episodes about all the health stuff yes. that our students have going on if they're not feeling well or they're tired or they're whatever maybe they're not up for a super long conversation and that's fine mm -hmm. and giving that control over to them so that they can be more engaged with the process because one thing that always ha tends to happen, I guess, with our students is that they have very little control and very little agency over what mm -hmm. happens in their day-to-day -day life. So anytime you can give control mm -hmm. is good for our students and they really appreciate that. So for yeah, sure. that's, that's and if my they're favorite used, yeah, yeah, that's great. And you just made me think, you know, if they're used to doing it that way, that they're the ones controlling it, then that means they can do it without you there uh -huh. to run the show. And so then they exactly. can practice it at home or at school or mm -hmm. with other people who the other people don't necessarily need to know how it works because they're not in charge. Exactly. Cool. I mean, I mean this is really it's a teenage -y kind of thing where I'm with my students in that age and stage. I'm really looking to hand over the mm -hmm. responsibility of their communication to yeah. them. Um, but that's my favorite, that and a good topic board. Yeah. Uh, I like to go for what I call everyday questions. And mm. I really steer away from the how old are you oh. and what's your favorite <laughs> colors. Yeah. Kind of thing, because... That's more of what you do when you're meeting somebody. You don't do that yeah. at the start of an average conversation. Exactly. And so if you see your favorite friend or your favorite teacher every day, like you, you can't ask them what's your favorite color every day. And some of our students <laughs> do get stuck yeah. into yeah. those kind of things. And it feels awkward. And the other person who's with them doesn't know if they're supposed to even answer because they right. heard that, you know, an hour ago. <laughs> right. But you're right that yeah. the everyday questions, those are much more typical to repeat. I mean, when I would yeah. get to work, you almost always say, how are you? Or what, how is yeah. your night or how is your weekend? And you can, I could ask you that every single day and you would think that was very um, expected behavior. <laughs> totally. And you can also ask, every single person the same question yeah yeah you can ask every so you know you have to if you're going for those kind of questions you don't have to learn as many mm -hmm. and they apply very widely which mm -hmm. is a nice thing and works well for the memory skills that our students have so that's great my favorite. love it yeah, yeah and I mean that 
alone is that one question encompassed a lot of skills that you would think about working on for oh, older yeah. students. So that's oh, a yeah. big, that's a heavy hitter. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a long term goal. And yeah, that's what we work on so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's something that, yeah. you know, you and I as adults are still working on, you know, you and I still like to have really good conversations and we think about how what kind of questions can we ask to which well, people yeah. and you know it's there's no concrete endpoint in like I have achieved two way no. conversation. No, because you can add not, you know, working on what are interruptions, <laughs> how do yeah. you end it properly, what um, you know, perspective taking and thinking about that person and what they would be interested in talking about. So there's so much you can cover. Mm-hmm. And, and cover repeatedly until it's really, they're more independent in doing that. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of typical adults who can work on these conversation skills too. Yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> everybody. We'll go back sure. and critique this podcast today and I'm sure I'm interrupted. <laughs> <or can. laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. So you guys, this has been a really fun conversation to kind of listen to because I feel like as an OT, I learned so much from you um, as speech language pathologists every day and try to apply some of those skills and some of those conversation repair strategies with my own kiddos. You definitely do. So yeah, so no, thank yeah. you so much for providing that because I think it's super helpful for anybody working with, with our population. Jill, do you have any um, suggested resources or apps that you would like to recommend to parents? I do, especially um, from what we've talked about today. I'll keep it down to four that have come to mind. (laughs) Um, And so the first one is um, tooting our own horns because it's actually a video that I made with our colleague Riley Rosebush for the DSRF's website. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you just go to dsrf.org under resources, click on videos and um, the first one up there is pretty much about this. It's um, communication in Down syndrome. And so we do a more, much more thorough job of talking about the communication profile we tend to see mm-hmm. with people with Down syndrome. So relative strengths and things that are usually more challenging. And then we start to intro to general tips and strategies parents can try at home. Um, and the nice thing is uh, you, we have a lot of video footage showing this in action with real children and teenagers. So it's nice to see rather than just hearing instruction, you know, you're seeing what we're doing. So I would definitely recommend that. And it's half an hour. So it's quite easy to share with others and people. I think it's very digestible when you can watch a half hour video, especially with really cute kids. Um, And then the second communication video on there is um, about supporting communication for participation in school. So I think parents can absolutely still benefit, um, but it was geared towards um, the classroom. And so again, that one's half an hour and nice to share, you know, with your classroom teacher or education assistant and people like that. And once you're on that page, all of the reading videos are below it. So um, I definitely recommend that specific to this topic. Number two. I recommend anything made by Libby Kuman. She's a speech and language pathologist, and she's really an expert on communication development in Down syndrome. So, so much of what we've studied and learned, um, I did get to see her speak for a day too. You know, so much of that comes from her, Mm -hmm. and she has books for like early skills, later skills specific to school, the classroom. So I would just point you to her books and her online presence. Number three, another person or another name I'll throw out there is Laura Mize, Laura M-I-Z-E. And she, her website would be Teach Me to Talk. She also has a good podcast I like. And she has a lot around those things Marla and I discussed that are those pre-language or um, pre-speech skills. Mm -hmm. So those other interaction and social and pre-language. The base of the cupcake. 
So the yeah. base of the cupcake. Go to Laura <laughs> for the base of the cupcake. And she has really parent-friendly home activities that she um, demonstrates and she gives nice kind of step-by-step -step lists of how to approach those skills. Um, so I think it's really user-friendly as well. And then the last one, you know, we talked a lot about sign language. So if you want to start to dive into that, babysignlanguage.com and also signing time are good resources for, you know, learning the signs, watching fun videos with songs and, you know, accessing other resources to get going. And then I personally always use and recommend signingsavvy.org, S-A-V-V-Y, Signing Savvy. Um, and those are just free video clips. So you just type in a word and then you can watch a video of someone demonstrating the sign for that word. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a manageable way to get going too by just learning the keywords that um, are important for your child, you know, because at the start, you can start with just looking up their favorite toys and foods and people and then expand from there. Awesome. So those would be my big ones based on the major things we've talked about today. Um, do you want to add any favorites, Marla? Oh, I think that's a beautiful okay. list. Yeah, we don't need to uh, overload. Yeah, I don't want to overload people. I always encourage people to talk to their SLP. And mm -hmm. if you don't have one, try and find one, or you're always welcome to contact us here at the DSRF, and we can arrange some kind of consultation too, mm -hmm. um, to answer your individual questions and kind of go through resources that might be specific to your child. So yeah. And even just specific questions if that have come up based on what we said today. Yeah. Yep. Like we said, we love the questions. We do. Yeah. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And those are amazing resources. And I definitely would recommend everyone watch the videos that you and Riley made. I watched them a couple of times as refreshers. And I also recommend a lot of our volunteers or practicum students that come to DSRF to watch them because I think it's a really important knowledge base to have before we, anyone really starts working with our kiddos. So thank you. Know, that's really nice. Out. Those are super helpful and so well done. Joe, we kind of referred to this a little bit earlier in our podcast of just the, the kind of the COVID crisis that we're living under right now. So given that I am assuming, you know, your presentations are on hold for a bit. Yeah. Do you have any other kind of projects that you're working on? And can our parents, um, at least the ones that you've already made connections with in the Okanagan, can they still contact you for some questions, consultations? Absolutely. So my email is Jillian, J-I-L-L-I-A-N, at dsrf.org. And yeah, absolutely welcome to contact me. And whether it's emailing with specific questions or troubleshooting while you're especially taking the lead at home. We are working on setting up some teletherapy, so getting on the computer so we can see each other via video, or even just, if, you know, figuring out if there's specific materials that we can make that would help at home and send your way. For now, we're trying to be, you know, flexible about ways we can support parents at home right now. And then, yeah, beyond that, I'm hoping that down the road we can get back to having these workshops and gatherings and home and school visits. But basically, whatever comes up while you're at home with your child trying to put everything into action, don't hesitate to ask a question or ask for materials or even just getting pointed in the right direction for resources right now. Mm -hmm. yeah that's super helpful thank you so much for joining us today um no no it was great um and yeah and we hope to have you back on again to talk about another fun topic but uh That'd for be now, great. Yeah, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon thank you so much you too. thank you guys okay. thank you jill we'll talk soon next week on the lowdown a down syndrome podcast after a period of time, we realized that Clint had become our best employee. You know, early to work, wouldn't take a break, didn't want to go home at the end of the shift. The, the job had become everything to him. Mm -hmm. Customers were coming to the store and saying, the reason I come here is because of Clint. But Clint makes my day. I walk in here, I'm, I'm, I'm angry, I'm mad, I've got a full day of work ahead of me, and I see Clint with a smile on his face, you know, busting tables, and it changes my day. And so... We were hearing all kinds of feedback like that. 
The business grew very fast. We have five, five restaurants in five years. And each time we opened a new restaurant, we added people with intellectual disabilities in a position very similar to Clint. And after a couple of years, I noticed that there was a very different attitude towards the job by those who were disabled than those who went. They didn't look at the clock to see where their shift ended, go in the next smoke break was there. Their productivity rate was higher than those without disabilities. They never cut corners. They only did the job the right way. There's only one way. Once you teach somebody to do the job, they only do the job that way. Mm-hmm. They wore the uniform with pride. They were the best dressed people in my business. I noticed that there was a business case. And I thought if we were to hire many more people who were disabled, we would have lower turnover, we would have lower absenteeism, and at that time I didn't realize that we would also have higher, higher levels of people doing things in a different way, people mm-hmm. who were going to be more innovative. The Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast, is a production of Down Syndrome Research Foundation. Learn more at dsof.org and join the conversation at DSOF Canada on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The Lowdown is hosted by Marla Foden and Hannah Mahmood and is produced by Glenn Hughes. The Lowdown theme music and George Dew was written and recorded by Rick Scott.